Okay, well, um, thank you very much for this uh, privilege um, and the honor of some of your time. Um, I come from North Florida in the Southern part of the United States. That's my home. Uh, and so the English that I speak is nothing like the uh, perfect English, which you learned uh, in school. So I will start off slowly so that everybody can calibrate their ears. When I listen uh, to my to somebody read my uh, biography, my CV, I'm, I'm always reminded how old I am and uh, <laughs> lucky to have had uh, you know, so many so many opportunities like that. Um, I, I do live in Frankfurt, Germany now. And uh, I would say I spend most of every day working on uh, the relationship between the United States and Europe, uh, the United States and NATO, and doing what I can to help make sure that Ukraine is successful and is able to regain sovereignty over all of its territory. Those are the things Whatever job I'm doing, those are the priorities I have. I want to pause just to make sure, is everybody, hold your hand up if you can understand at least most of what I'm saying. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, and I do, uh, it's important to me to uh, answer every question that you have to uh, to address as many of the things that you want to uh, to talk about. So I will absolutely save uh, the majority of the time uh, for that. First, how did we get here? Why, why are we in this war in Ukraine now? And And as I think about your studies and what you're doing and what you might do in the future, uh, one of the most important things I would want you to, to keep in mind is that this war is the result of what we call failed deterrence. It is about how we in the West, and also Ukraine, but especially in the West, we failed to react strongly after Russia invaded Georgia in 2008. We failed to react strongly after Russia supported the Assad regime using chemical weapons against their own people in Syria, even though President Obama had said there was a red line against that. Uh, and we did not respond strongly after Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014 and illegally annexed Crimea. So I think the Russians, the Kremlin, saw that they could probably do this again and that the West would not, would not react. They also saw the way that we ended our uh, operations in Afghanistan, that the, the way that the war in Afghanistan ended. It was a disastrous withdrawal. They could also see that we had terrible domestic problems in the United States, with President Trump refusing to accept that he had lost the election, and then we had the, the uh, riot on January the 6th by our capital. So I think the Kremlin looked and saw us as being a, a democracy. They saw that we were weak and probably thought that we were vulnerable. And then they saw that Germany was still building Nord Stream 2, even late in 2021. And so NATO, the United States, the European Union, we did not seem unified and even acknowledging or recognizing the threat. So I think they, the Kremlin believed that they would be able to walk into Ukraine and that the West would not react very strongly. But I think it's also important that you as young Ukrainians also hold your own government accountable. What, what happened after 2014, after Russia invaded Ukraine, illegally annexed Crimea, uh, supported the so-called separatists in Donetsk and Luhansk. After the, uh, the, the fighting and the ceasefire uh, occurred, 
for several years, what did Ukraine do to prepare for an expansion of the conflict? I would say not enough. Um, ammunition was not produced. New equipment was not produced. Uh, the Territorial Defense Force was not yet uh, developed. So all the things that Ukraine is doing so well right now did not happen in the last five years. So um, Ukraine has to bear some responsibility for Russia believing that they would be able to just roll right in and take over. And so one of the, the things I would want you to keep in mind is the importance for a democratic society uh, to be strong, to resist disinformation, to resist corruption, uh, to ensure uh, a strong media and a strong judicial system. This, this is just as important for defending your country as is having a strong military. But anyway, that's why we are here now. We, we are in this war. Ukraine is being attacked by Russia because all of us failed to hold Russia accountable up until now. So why does this war matter? Obviously for Ukraine, you're defending your homeland. I imagine everybody in this lecture hall has a friend or a family member that is either in the military or maybe your home has been destroyed or you know somebody that's lost somebody. So I imagine everybody in that room um, feels this personally. But why does the rest of the world care? Why does the United States care? Why does Germany, Poland, UK, Lithuania, France, why do they care? Why should they care? This is about what we call the international rules-based order the order that was established after the end of the Second World War, the UN Charter that talks about respect for sovereignty, for borders, respect for international law, respect for human rights, respect for freedom of navigation on the Black Sea, for example, uh, as well as in the Pacific and in other places, um, respect for international um, legal processes. That's that's what Russia hates and is trying to destroy. And so if we say that we are serious about these values, about this international order, you have to defend it. It doesn't, obviously, it doesn't defend itself. It takes all of us working together to protect it. And of course, this is also important because China is watching. The Chinese are watching to see, do we really or do we really care about sovereignty, about respect for borders? Do we really care about freedom of navigation? Do we really care about international law? If we don't, then I think China might make the same terrible miscalculation that the Kremlin did. That's why this matters. What will be the outcome? I believe Ukraine is going to win this war and you're going to regain all of your territory back to the borders of 1991. Yes, that includes Crimea, all of Donbass, all of Ukrainian sovereign territory. Your, your president has said that's the, that's the expected outcome, and I believe this is what's going to happen. Uh, the speed with which this happens, of course, depends a lot on support from the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, and other countries. But there's no doubt in my mind that Ukraine is going to win this war. Why am I so optimistic? And I do get accused by people of being too optimistic sometimes. Um, but let me tell you why I am optimistic. We know from history that war is a test of will and it is a test of logistics. It is a test of will between Ukraine and Russian soldiers. You are defending your homeland. I don't think many Russian soldiers actually want to be in Ukraine. And we know that last year, when the Kremlin announced mobilization, over 500,000 Russian men that were military age left the country rather than be uh, mobilized 
to fight in this war. So that tells me that the willpower among average Russians is not very strong. The second test, the test of logistics, gets better for Ukrainian forces every day. More than 50 nations are providing equipment, ammunition, supplies, money to support Ukraine. Ukraine is learning how to do, uh, how to improve its own logistical situation. Uh, on the Russian side, their logistics infrastructure is fragile. Ukrainian armed forces are attacking their logistical structure every day. And there's only one or two countries that support Russia, including Iran, for example, that provides some drones and some ammunition. So the, the logistical test also continues to get better in favor of Ukraine. And then finally, I look at positive leadership as why I'm an optimist. Uh, we have seen through history a leader that is able to uh, convey to um, his people or his soldiers what's going on, why we're doing this, and, and, and to give them confidence always ends up being successful. And I look at your president. Even if you may disagree with some of his policies from before the war, the whole world looks at President Zelensky as an example of courageous positive leadership, his decision to stay there with his family. He is out everywhere talking to soldiers. He is talking to the nations. And there's a reason that 50 nations are supporting Ukraine because of the positive example of your president. But also I am so impressed with General Zaluzhny, uh, the chief of your defense forces. Um, he is an impressive soldier. He is uh, disciplined. Um, he uh, understands how to do this, how to get the most out of uh, Ukrainian armed forces potential. He's clever. And I also, um, I've spoken with him several times. He is compassionate. He cares about his soldiers. And I think his soldiers know that, they, that he cares about them. And he will do everything he can to make sure that their lives are never sold cheaply, but that he will do everything he can to protect them as well as ensure that they accomplish the mission. So some people say, okay, that's nice, but why are you still so optimistic? Well, let's look at the facts on the ground. After nine years, after nine years of war, Russia controls only about 16% of Ukraine. Russia has failed to achieve air superiority, even though they have a huge advantage in numbers and types of modern aircraft. They have not been able to destroy a single train or convoy uh, being uh, bringing equipment and ammunition from Poland into Ukraine. And by some estimates, there are over 200,000 Russian soldiers who have been killed or wounded or captured. That's an enormous amount of casualties uh, for a war for any country. And we see that on the Russian side, their leadership, the opposite of General Zeluzhny, who, by the way, I think graduated from Ostro Academy maybe a few years ago, um, the leadership on the Russian side is the exact opposite of General Zeluzhny. They hate each other. Prigozhin, Shoigu, Gerasimov, Kadyrov, they all hate each other. There is no cohesion, uh, which means that they will not have a cohesive plan uh, with which to defend where they are now. Um, I think that um, there are even reports that it came out here just a couple of days ago about uh, Russian soldiers and uh, the uh, Mr. Prigozhin's uh, Wagnerites were fighting each other outside of Bakhmut. So this kind of um, chaos on the Russian side, of course, is a vulnerability that I anticipate that the Ukrainian general staff will exploit. Uh, the Russian Black Sea Fleet, the only thing that they're able to do is to launch expensive missiles against apartment buildings. They don't want to come anywhere near the uh, Ukrainian coastline. 
So this is part of the reason that I am so optimistic. And then I look at Ukraine. While at war, you're continuing to grow and build your armed forces. You're continuing to invest in modernization effort. You're continuing to do training and education of your officers. And Ukraine is, is I mean, look at you. You're in university right now. While your country's at war, your government, your families are still investing in your education, thinking about the future, about what comes next. Ukraine has 50 partners led by the United States, Germany, and the UK that are supporting Ukraine. Everybody I know has been so impressed with how fast Ukrainian soldiers learn to use new technology, how adaptive you are. And I, I go to a lot of conferences these days and everybody that's involved with technology always talks about how we should be copying how Ukraine integrates new technology. What is it about the Ukrainian military, Ukrainian population that allows people to test and experiment and, and integrate and get the most out of new technologies? I think all of us are gonna be watching how you do this uh, for a long time. Uh, of course, there still is a challenge with maintenance and logistics. Um, so much equipment has been provided to Ukraine that comes from different countries, but that makes it difficult when you have to repair so many different types of vehicles, so many different types of artillery. Um, do you take it all the way back to Poland or Germany or Slovakia, or can we bring forward the capability to fix it in Ukraine? That's a lot of people are trying to do that. All right, so how, how does Ukraine win? What does, what does winning actually mean? When I listen to your president, he says, complete full restoration of Ukraine's sovereign territory, 1991 borders. So that's, that's number one, restore all sovereignty. Number two, a return of thousands of Ukrainian children that have been deported. Bring them all back. Number three, accountability for Russian war crimes. Um, the International Criminal Court, which is in The Hague, of course, has already indicted President Putin and his Minister for Children's Rights, Mrs. Belova, uh, for genocide. And I feel that there is a growing effort in the, in the West to create an international war crimes tribunal that would prosecute Russia for the crime of aggression. So I think this accountability is actually definitely going to happen. Uh, and I do some work uh, with Human Rights First to help with collecting um, evidence of these war crimes. The fourth element of winning is a long-term security guarantee. What does that mean? Obviously, the most important long-term security guarantee is NATO membership. And there is increasing support for this to happen. It's not gonna happen as fast as any of us want it to, but I can sense in the different uh, people that I speak to from different countries in the United States, as well as across Europe, that there is a growing recognition that Ukraine's security and, and stability, and actually then the stability and security of Europe depends on Ukraine being in NATO. Maybe we can talk about that during the question and answer. Ukraine, Ukrainian membership in the European Union. This is an important objective, what winning looks like. And then finally, of course, the reconstruction and rebuilding of Ukraine so that millions of Ukrainians who had to leave can return back to Ukraine, uh, back to a place to live, back to jobs. And of course, so much of the world depends on what Ukraine provides to the world. So how do we win? I believe that Crimea is the decisive terrain. Crimea is the most important part of this conflict. Ukraine will never be safe or secure as long as Russian forces hold Crimea. Ukraine will never be able to rebuild its economy as long as Russia occupies Crimea and blocks access to the Azov Sea or, to, or can disrupt traffic going in and out of Mykolaiv 
or Odessa. And so I think at some point, uh, Ukrainian armed forces are going to liberate Crimea. I believe it could happen this year if the West, if the West provides everything that's needed. In fact, I think it could happen by the end of this summer, by the end of August, if the West provides everything that Ukraine needs. Bakhmut is important, obviously. It was a city of 70,000 Ukrainian people. Um, but from a strategic military standpoint, it was important because the Russians were willing to spend thousands of lives to capture that city. And so while it would have been very difficult for the general staff and President Zelensky uh, to stay there, they, they made the right decision to stay, to allow Russian forces to bleed there, to, to stay fixed there. And yet the way they did it, they were able to do this without having to divert the new armor brigades that are needed for the counterattack. So this was a very this would have been a very difficult decision for the general staff and for your president, but it was I believe it was the right decision because it gave it now gives Ukraine a the time to build up a strong force that it will use for the counteroffensive. How and when and where that finally happens. How do you liberate Crimea? I think you do it in three phases. Number one, you liberate it by isolating it. Obviously, that means uh, cutting what people in the West call the land bridge that connects Crimea to Rostov uh, along the Azov coastline. So Mariupol, Melitopol, and down in, in Verdansk, and, and then down into uh, Crimea. So you cut that. Uh, with uh, land forces. And then the second phase, you bring up more long-range precision weapons that can reach that can reach Crimea and make it untenable for Russian forces. Make the Black Sea Fleet have to leave Sevastopol. Make the Air Force have to leave Saki. Make the or destroy the logistics buildup at Jankoy. These are the kind of things that I think will be happening here in the next couple of months. And then finally, after Russian forces have left, uh, then Ukrainian forces can enter Crimea, clear it, and secure it. Now, the Kerch Bridge, people always talk about this famous bridge. Um, I don't know this, but I think that the Ukrainian general staff probably wants to leave it up for a while to allow Russians to leave. Give them the chance to get out of Crimea because that's really what we care about is Crimea coming back under Ukrainian control. But at some point, I think they have to destroy that bridge so that it can never be used again to um, isolate or block uh, shipping from going up into Azov Sea. And I'm not an engineer, but I think that that bridge actually is built on a foundation um, uh, that is unstable and that it will collapse at some point anyway. It will always be a vulnerable bridge. Okay. And finally, what comes next? What comes next? I think that the United States, well, I know that the United States is going to continue to support Ukraine. I know that the United States is looking more and more at the Black Sea region uh, as an important strategic area. This is not a surprise to you, but to many people in the West, the Black Sea seems a, a long way off. Uh, but now more and more people are becoming with the, familiar with the geography of the Black Sea and understanding the important role that Ukraine plays, as well as Georgia and Romania and Turkey. So... Uh, I, I anticipate the United States uh, will look at this from a strategic approach, which means, um, in fact, this is this is how we we uh, develop strategy. We use a structure called DIME, D-I-M-E, diplomacy, information, military, and economy. These are sort of the four main categories of developing a strategic plan. So the military actually 
is only a small part of, uh, of a strategy. It's the diplomatic effort, ha having allies, uh, enforcing international law, economic development. These are the things that I think are going to, that we're going to see uh, over the next two, three, four years after this conflict has been ended. The last thing I'll say, and then I want to stop and, and, and take questions. Uh, I mean, I sat in lecture halls myself many times over the years, and after about 30 minutes, I can't stand to listen to anybody continue talking to myself. So um, I think that the, um, the two big questions that are out there, will Russia use a nuclear weapon? And I would be interested in hearing what some of you think about that. And the other question is, what happens after Russia is pushed out of Ukraine? After Russia loses Crimea, what happens then? Will there be a collapse of the Federation of the, or just of the regime? Or will the regime be able to come up with a new narrative for why they have to leave? Uh, these are these are things that I think we ought to we ought to address in the um, question and answer part. Okay, that was about thirty minutes. Let's stop there. I want to use the rest of the time to answer the questions that you have. Good afternoon, Mr. Hodges. My name is Ivan Vasilets. I'm uh, a second year student of international relations. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your interesting lecture. We really appreciate your sharing of your knowledge. And my question is about Black Sea problem in uh, international relations. Because um, Russian Black Sea fleet domination in this region uh, was always a problem for us, especially since 2018, when the Kerch Strait incident took place. And even after our victory and end of war, uh, it would be a huge problem for us, because now, regrettably, we don't have an opportunity to destroy the whole uh, Black Sea Fleet of Russia. And what is the solution of this problem? Shall we build up our own navy, or shall we allow NATO ships to be present in our ports, or should it be a combination of these two points? Thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, there are three or four aspects to this that I, I would uh, want to offer. Uh, first of all, of course, part of Ukraine's victory uh, will include destruction of the Black Sea Fleet to, to make sure uh, that it is not able to continue to operate not in strength in the Black Sea region. So uh, I am sure that the general staff is looking at ways that they can hit, continue to hit ships uh, either with long-range weapons uh, like Storm Shadow uh, or um, the uh, uh, what we call maritime unmanned systems, Navy drones, like Ukraine has already used before to attack some Russian ships in the Black Sea. I think this, this is going to continue uh, until Russia has redeployed away from Crimea and perhaps back to a, uh, their base at Novorossiysk, which is not nearly as effective as, uh, as Sevastopol. Now, of course, um, what we've got to do is figure out in the Black Sea, how do we counter Russia's naval power? We should be able to do that by, you have three NATO allies, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania. But because we have not had a strategy for the Black Sea region, Turkey does not trust the West. Uh, Bulgaria does not have much capability and Romania is reluctant to act by themselves. So this is why when I talk about having a strategy for the Black Sea region, uh, this is how we get not only those nations there to work together, but also to work with Ukraine as it rebuilds its own naval capability. And then, the, and then NATO works within the constraints of the Montreux Convention. I'm sure you're familiar with Montreux Convention. 
uh, a, treaty, a treaty that was signed in 1936, which gave Turkey sovereignty over the Straits, the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. And that means that the United States, the UK, the Netherlands, France, other, other countries that are not Black Sea countries, their ships can only come up into the Black Sea for 21 days at a time with permission of Turkey. So we've got to have a strategy that will generate uh, more ships that will come up into the Black Sea. And then finally, um, you know, of course, Ukraine will have to think about what Navy does it need? Um, does it have big ships? Or maybe that's not the best way in, in, inside the Black Sea um, to protect your coastline and, and to protect shipping. I think it's going to be a combination of smaller vessels, unmanned systems, and working with other allies and partners in the region. But the United States and I think the UK are, are both going to increase what we do in the Black Sea, but still within the restrictions of, of Montreux. Thank you, General, for your answer. Uh, we, ho we also have so many questions online, so please, Yaroslav Burkut. Turn on your camera, please. Yes, of course. Um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Yaroslav Burkut, and I am a second year student of the uh, Department of International Relations. And uh, I have a question for you, and it concerns the peace formula of Ukraine, uh, in particular, the punishment of uh, Russia of Russia, of its aggression, and, uh, well, as I've said, one of key aspects of our victory is punishment of Russia. And for now, the only, the only tool that we have for that is International Criminal Court. But as we know, the Rome Statute of the ICC does not provide punishment for an act of aggression for countries that are not, not parties of it. And therefore, in our situation, I think uh, it's ineffective. And um, in the interview of uh, in, in the interview to Times Radio, you agreed that it's finally time to for America to become a signatory of Rome Statute. And um, my question is, um, will sound like that. Um, is it against of American interest to become a signatory of? America of um, Rome statute and how do you think how can you evaluate the chances of Ukraine for punishing the Russia for its aggression thank you okay Yaroslav thank you another very good question um, first of course I want the United States uh, to become a signatory to the Rome statute even though there is some risk and some nations will try to find opportunities to exploit that uh, in a way that would be unfair to American soldiers. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, it's better for the United States that if we also uh, join such an important international body, it's our, our credibility, I think, is strengthened if we do that. And then, of course, if our soldiers uh, are doing, if, if we don't train our soldiers correctly and they do something wrong, then they should be punished. So I think that I think this will eventually come, just not right now. Um, I'm doing what I can with Human Rights First. Uh, I wrote an opinion piece that was published two weeks ago, along with uh, General Clark and General Breedlove, encouraging the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Austin, to at least help the ICC with gathering or collecting evidence of war crimes as an as an interim step. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, I do believe that more and more countries are talking about the need for an international tribunal that could address uh, what you're talking about, the, the crime of aggression, because you're right, the ICC does not have the jurisdiction to address that specific crime. I've heard Ms. Baerbock, the uh, foreign minister from Germany, talk specifically about this as well. So I think there's growing consensus that this will need to be done particularly as Russia continues to, to commit war crimes every day with its attacks on innocent, on innocent people. 
there are a lot of different organizations that are helping to collect evidence now that are trying to help the Ukrainian uh, chief prosecutor. I saw him on a, a, a Zoom call the other day. I'm impressed with the amount of work that's being done by the international community in this. But the best way for right now, until these legal processes take place, um, the best way to punish Russia is to continue destroying their forces, uh, to continue to beat them on the battlefield. Uh, and that's what Ukrainian forces are doing now. Um, I think that the uh, it'll be many years before Russia is able to rebuild the damage that it has caused to itself and that it has suffered at the hands of, uh, of Ukrainian armed forces. Thank you very much, General. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Maxim Lubczynski, and uh, I am a fourth year student uh, majoring in history and archaeology. So my question is, uh, among all the actions that led Russia to invade Ukraine, can you point out any mistakes or miscalculations made by the USA? And uh, since 2014, uh, was there a chance uh, to prevent the full-scale invasion uh, of Russia? Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time uh, to save the uh, status quo uh, and uh, in the international environment for USA and to the allies. Thank you for your reply. So the, the key question was, are there mistakes by the United States that I should address? Is that correct? Okay, okay. So um, two or three mistakes that, that we made, that the United States made, um, we did not react strongly or decisively after Russia's invasion of Georgia. I mean, we really did nothing. Uh, and that's why you still have Russian troops uh, occupying part of, of uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, we, didn't, we did not think strategically about the Black Sea region. We, most of the conversation you hear people talk about Georgia as if it's an island or I Ukraine as if it's an, an island. And so we didn't put enough attention uh, enough there and, and allowed Russia to do pretty much what they wanted to. Um, we we uh, did not respond after the Russians stepped over President Obama's red line about uh, the Assad regime using chemical weapons against their own people. And then after the invasion in 2014, uh, we did not do enough uh, to, to respond to what uh, Russia had done against Ukraine. And in fact, we kind of let turned it over to Germany and France, or we didn't turn it to them. They, they took the lead and we did not do enough to help. We did not contribute here. And so I think we were late getting, realizing the seriousness of this and even when we did start providing training for Ukrainian soldiers in Yavariv, for example, near Lviv, um, there was still a debate about whether or not to give weapons. I mean, this looks ridiculous in hindsight, but at the time, there was concern about the, how Russia might escalate. And so, and that's really probably, the, I think, one of the biggest mistakes we, we have made, even up until now, we overestimate the possibility that Russia might escalate and use a nuclear weapon. Now, of course, Russia has thousands of nuclear weapons. Uh, they clearly do not care how many people, innocent people they kill. So my president has, to, and every president has to be concerned about the possibility, but I think we have overestimated that possibility. And in fact, the Russians can see that. I don't think they're gonna use a nuclear weapon. There's no advantage for them to use a nuclear weapon. The Chinese have told them not to do it. My president has said they will pay a, they will suffer catastrophic consequences if they use a nuclear weapon. But we still are, are concerned about it. And, and I think this is a mistake that we are so hesitant because of the possibility of Russia using a nuclear weapon. So this is something that we've got to address. Um, and then finally, I think we uh, we the, the previous president, President Trump, when he questioned NATO, 
I mean, that was a that was a gift to the Kremlin when the American president, for the first time in my life, questioned NATO and threatened to pull out. That was a signal to the Russians how that we were not unified. And I think that's what encouraged them also to feel that they could make the terrible miscalculations that they made. Thank you very much for the complete answer. We have another question from the user online, student online. Itechko Alexandra. Yep, I'm here just a minute. Okay, so actually, my greetings, and you, thank you so much for your uh, speech. It's, it was really great. It was re really great. I'm a student of uh, Astroha Academy of International Relations, a second year student. And actually, what I'm talking about uh, today, uh, the war in our country is, I think, undoubtedly not about our Ukrainian government. It's not just about our Ukrainian government, about Ukrainian people, but also, I think, of the whole world in Europe. So that's why I think the vivid example of that is NATO, uh, which undeniably occupies a key place on the support front uh, for our country and of course and of course always stands uh, on the basis of security guarantees. And here is uh, my question. So how do you think um, are there any alternatives to NATO security guarantees that actually can ensure the territorial integrity of Ukraine now and actually in the future or actually joining an alliance is our only option for our country. Thank you so much. Okay, this is this is probably the biggest question, uh, one of the biggest questions that the uh, Alliance will address in Vilnius uh, in July during the next uh, NATO summit is what, how can we help Ukraine? Uh, is it going to be NATO membership? And I personally think that while membership may not be uh, offered at Vilnius, I think there will be the nations will go as far as they possibly can to lay out a concrete path. So something that is better than the uh, Bucharest summit where it was mentioned, promised, but there was no clear path. And I think that was a mistake. So I, I think everybody wants to avoid making the same mistake of an open sort of promise without having a clear path. And, and I know that uh, the leaders of, of all 31 nations, as well as the leadership in Brussels, are working on on that. That's what I'm going to be watching for. But in the meanwhile, you know, even a concrete path does not add to Ukraine's security. So I think that the United States and probably a few other countries are going to work closely with Ukraine to continue um, helping with modernization, continuing to help with uh, investment. Um, it's in the interest of all European countries of the European Union, obviously, that Russia is uh, is deterred, uh, that Ukraine is able to rebuild its uh, infrastructure, rebuild economy, start exporting grain again in a, on a large scale, uh, and so that refugees in Europe are able to go back home. So I think Europe knows this. I know they know that, and, and they're going to be interested in doing this as well. So th this will be a challenging process. You know, we, we look at the Marshall Plan now after World War II and you hear Marshall Plan and everything was wonderful. It was very, very difficult. It was very difficult to get the U.S. Congress to agree to invest that much money. So it took real leadership in the United States to uh, encourage the Congress to make that sort of investment, uh, especially so soon after the end of the war. I think people under, understand this now. Um, I think even the Russians, in a way, after Putin, uh, understand that they will be safer if Ukraine is in NATO, which is which is an interesting uh, uh, idea, a concept that Dr. Kissinger said just a few weeks ago, that it's in Russia's benefit that Ukraine is in NATO. Because if Ukraine is not in NATO, then it will feel the need to make sure it's never attacked again. And it will do everything to include even possibly developing a nuclear weapon, something to protect itself from Russia. And so a really, really strong, angry Ukraine that has that is unlimited um, could be very aggressive against Russia. So Russia's security is uh, actually better 
with Ukraine inside NATO. And I, I had never thought of it that way until I heard Dr. Kissinger's uh, suggestion that he that's what he would tell Putin. Now, that would be, of course, that would force the Kremlin to have to walk back all the nonsense they've been saying for years about what a threat NATO is. But I think in the post-Putin era, hopefully there will be some people who are more, um, who can think more clearly about strategy in trying to re reclaim a place in the international community. Thank you, John. Very interesting idea. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Alexandra, a first year student of international relations, and uh, I have a question about uh, the NATO and the NATO summit that will take place in Vilnius this year in July, uh, because um, it is probably an event on which uh, every Ukrainian awaits, and our nation surely looking forward to uh, entering the alliance. Um, Therefore, me and my colleagues are interested if NATO countries have any de depth about our future membership and is uh, there still place for any obstacles on Ukraine's way to the alliance. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm very, very interested myself in, in, in how this is going to, uh, um, what's going to come out of Vilnius. Um, I think it would be a terrible um, blow against NATO's credibility if Vilnius does not produce something that looks like, feels like membership action plan for Ukraine. Now, in order to get all 31 nations to agree, they may have to call it something else, but I think you're going to see probably some decisions that will um, uh, that will uh, represent those concrete steps that I'm talking about. Uh, one I hear about all the time uh, is to take the current relationship between Ukraine and NATO, which is called the the NATO Ukraine Commission. Uh, but to elevate that up to the NATO-Ukraine Council, that, that would give Ukrainian uh, representatives more access to information, uh, policies. Uh, it would have benefits for training. Uh, so th this would be an important step in a signal in the right direction. Um, I don't know for sure which nations um, would be against it. I think I think my own president is concerned right now because of this over- uh, uh, overestimation of the threat of Russian escalation. I think that this is the number one obstacle is that some nations fear that Russia might do something. I don't believe it. And, and so the people that want uh, the United States and other countries to support Ukrainian membership have got to continue to address that and to reduce the anxiety that Russia might use a nuclear weapon. Um, I think that the, uh, of course, Hungary is not very helpful. Um, there's a lot of friction between Hungary and Ukraine over uh, because of Mr. Orban's, um, I think, he, partly his close relationship with Russia, but also his approach uh, and nationalistic approach to how Hungarian, uh, the Hungarian diaspora or uh, ethnic minorities in, in Ukraine are treated. So this is something that I think the Ukrainian government's gonna have to address with Hungary to, to uh, relieve Hungary's uh, concerns. Of course, we also hope that Turkey will finally drop its um, objection to Sweden uh, becoming a member of NATO. Um, Secretary General Stoltenberg has been personally involved. He just was with the, the Turkish government, uh, President Erdogan, just yesterday, I think. Um, but uh, we're not there yet. There's still, in fact, there was a huge protest by pro-PKK Kurds in Sweden yesterday. So there, this is, this is going to be an obstacle for getting Sweden 
into uh, into NATO as well. So the whole world's going to be watching. I can't guarantee any outcomes. Um, I just know that the the vast majority of nations want Ukraine in NATO now, and I think there's a lot of pressure on that. Um, but we're going to have to wait and see. I, I can't guarantee an outcome. Thank you, General, for this optimism. Yes, we do need it for sure. We have one more question from from the internet, from online. Sofia Romanian, at least. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sonia Dechuk. I'm the first year student of uh, international relations. Uh, we're really happy to see you, hear you. And uh, my question is, in June 2022, uh, by the decision of European Council, Ukraine received uh, the status of the candidate state uh, for European Union membership, although it is clear that it will take years to join European Union. Uh, among the obvious difficulties uh, on this path is Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine and the need to adapt our legislation to European Union legislation. Uh, so what would you advise? Uh, how can we do our work on preparing uh, for a European integration more faster, more effective and more efficient? Thank you. I listened uh, to Dr. von der Leyen uh, last week and I was in Bratislava for a conference and she came and spoke uh, to everybody there. And I was so impressed with how strongly she advocated for uh, Ukraine uh, to become a member of the European Union. She, I mean, she led off her presentation talking about how proud she was that um, candidate status had been offered or extended to Ukraine. So that, that's obviously um, a real plus having somebody like her um, who is growing in stature and, and uh, um, support every day that she would be such a strong advocate for Ukraine. <clears throat> and then right after her, I heard President Macron uh, speak to the same group. And he also talked about the importance of, of Ukrainian victory and uh, a, a peace that is in line with the UN Charter, which means that Ukraine gets all of its territory back, sovereign territory, uh, and that Russia is held accountable for the violations of the UN Charter. So in other words, you've got the president of France and you've got the president of the European Commission completely in support of Ukrainian membership. This is a good thing. So what should Ukraine do? Um, first of all, there's a, there's a list of what's required. I mean, your government, obviously, and probably most Ukrainians know what those standards are. I would do everything possible to keep moving towards those standards. Um, I think that uh, the things that make Ukraine so successful right now, uh, the talented young people of your country, and, and to be honest, uh, the incredible women that I have met that work, that are, serve in the parliament, in the RADA, um, and, and in your government, I have met so many really incredibly talented people. Get out of their way. Let them uh, let them uh, use that talent. And uh, I, I think all these standards will be met. Uh, the importance of a of a free media that can expose corruption, I think, is really really important. Um, and maybe the most important element of any democracy is the judiciary. You can see that the judiciary in Poland is under attack. The judiciary in the United States is under attack. Uh, this is where you really protect democracy. And so I think for Ukraine, unleashing the talent of young people, uh, making sure that the media is able to expose corruption and that the, the judiciary, the judicial processes of Ukraine are above any sort of, of um, reproach. Those are the critical things. And I'm impressed. Um, I know there was a, a big uh, arrest that was made the, a few weeks ago about somebody in the Ukrainian judiciary. Some people might point to that as an example of corruption. Most people, though, see that as an example of Ukraine addressing corruption. That's a good thing. 
too much general. Yes, that's what we are basically doing here at the National University of Australia Academy. We are teaching and bringing the students with zero tolerance to corruption. We are teaching young leaders, future enlighteners of the country, and we are proud of it. And actually, my question is, do you feel enough strength to continue? This is just the beginning with the questions. We have many more. Do I have one? Or do you have enough str strengths to continue? Do you feel <laughs> willingness to continue? I'm yes, please. I, I can go another 30 minutes. I'm I'm getting strength from all the young people in that room. Thank you so much. So we'll keep, we'll keep going. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good afternoon, sir. And thank you for this wonderful lecture. My name is Margarita Jakub. I am first year student majoring in political science. And my question will be as follows. Today, in the great uh, uncertainty about scenarios how for, of how the Russian-Ukrainian war uh, might end, it is clear that any settlement must include strong security guarantees for, for the Ukraine. In your opinion, uh, is there any alternative international legal mechanism other than Ukrainians' accession to NATO? Uh, that could provide security for Ukraine and uh, lasting peace in Europe. Thank you. So one of the things that uh, in terms of a settlement, that, uh, I hope that uh, President uh, Zelensky will uh, continue to, to stand firm on is that Crimea has to be returned to Ukraine. Um, I, I don't see how Ukraine will really be safe or secure as long as Russian forces occupy Crimea. The Russian Black Sea Fleet, Russian Air Force, drones, uh, logistics, all of these things there in Crimea. As long as Russia has that, even after a settlement, they'll wait one, two, or three years for the West to lose interest, and then they'll start again. So I think um, a settlement where Russia is rewarded with being able to retain control of territory that illegally that it illegally annexed, I think that would be uh, uh, that would be a mistake. But that's not for outsiders to determine. That's for the government of Ukraine to determine because you're the ones that are paying the huge price every day. But that would be part of any set. It would have to be part of any settlement. Um, I have noticed over the last few years that um, the nations of the Black Sea do not cooperate with each other very much. Um, and I'm talking about not only in the region, but also in Brussels and in Washington, D.C. Um, we all saw how Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania worked together all the time in Washington and Brussels. Those three nations together really were able to elevate their profile and get attention um, for security support because they worked together and put their voices together. And I just never see that from the Black Sea nations. Um, Ukraine and Romania a little bit, uh, but not much. Romania and Bulgaria do not really work together too much. Uh, Turkey, would like to be sort of the, the chief of the Black Sea, but they don't do a good job of helping cooperation. Uh, Georgia is moving in the wrong direction. I worry about Georgia every day now. So we've got to figure out a way to encourage the nations of the Black Sea to work together uh, on uh, attracting Western support to the region, not just to Ukraine. Now, you mentioned international mechanisms. Uh, almost every day, uh, I see on Twitter a report by a wonderful Turkish gentleman named Yurik Ishik. His, uh, he, his uh, Twitter name, he is the Bosphorus Watcher. And what he does, Yurik, he knows uh, what ships are going through the straits. And he always knows which ones are carrying um, stolen Ukrainian grain and taking it from Crimea to Syria, for example. So what we've got to do is figure out how can you shine the bright light 
on uh, 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 corruption and violations of sanctions, uh, violations of international law. Uh, and there are ways to do this. This is slow, it's painful, it's tedious, but it's got to be in combination with military effort. You have to have diplomatic effort. And something that a friend of mine, uh, he came up with the phrase lawfare, where you use the law to hold uh, the Russians accountable in all the different international institutions. This would require Ukraine working with other countries to keep holding Russia accountable when they violate international law. This is this has also got to be part of the long-term uh, uh, security for Ukraine. Thank you so much. One more question from online, Ilya Kachuk. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Ilyad Kachuk. I'm a student um, specialty in national security. My questions uh, from uh, what uh, you see, how uh, can you evaluate uh, the level of military and technical uh, preparation of uh, Ukrainian armed forces uh, for upcoming uh, country save? Thank you. What, what is, I'm sorry, Ilya. Mm -hmm. What say that again? What what is the level of preparation of Ukrainian armed forces for the counteroffensive? Yes. Okay. Good question. Of course, uh, one of the things that makes uh, I think has made Ukraine so successful so far is that uh, you guys are the best I've ever seen at protecting information. Uh, we know more about the Russians than we do about Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, which is as it should be. I should not know exactly how many tanks or how many brigades or uh, that Ukrainian forces have. I should not know where they are. I should not know what the plan is. And I don't. So what I'm going to tell you is based on my assessment of what I see from unclassified sources. And of course, I do have uh, Ukrainian friends that are in the military uh, that uh, I speak to whenever they're they're willing to talk with me. Um, so I have some confidence about what I'm going to say. I think that um, the last few months, uh, Ukraine has been very skillfully, carefully building up a large armored force. I mean, several brigades. I don't know how many, but more than five, more than seven, maybe even 10 or 12 armored brigades that will have tanks, uh, armored infantry vehicles, uh, self-propelled artillery, air defense, uh, the capabilities that will be needed to, to penetrate these Russian trenches. Uh, and I think they have been practicing for months. Some of them, of course, were trained in UK, some are trained in Germany, some have been training in Poland, and most of them probably training inside Ukraine. I think they have been practicing over and over and over how to get through a minefield, how to penetrate the barbed wire, the tank ditches, all the different things. Um, we call this combined arms. When you integrate engineers, armor, infantry, and so on, artillery. I also believe that Ukraine um, has really, really, really good special forces. I think that they are very active um, and uh, uh, creating, not only collecting intelligence, but also creating chaos in the Russian rear area. I imagine that there are also uh, partisans, people that are in the Russian rear area that do not want to be, the, that do not want to be occupied I think that they are probably making it very difficult for Russia, Russian forces to move around and, and to feel secure in their own rear area. So in terms of land forces, I think um, General Zeluzhny has done a good job along with all of his commanders of getting the land forces ready for whatever it is they're going to do, whenever they're going to do it. Uh, and I think that was he has three conditions he has to meet before he tells the president he's ready to go. Number one, 
are we ready? Are we strong enough? Have we trained enough? Do we have enough logistics and ammunition to, to go? Uh, number two, are the Russian forces degraded enough? Have the Russian logistics, the ammunition, the fuel, has that been destroyed enough? Have Russian air defense and artillery been degraded enough? Um, are the Russian commanders confused enough about what's happening? I don't know this, but I think all of this activity that's happening in Belgorod, for example, this is a nightmare uh, for the Russian general staff because they, they're trying to decide, is this a real big thing or is this a local thing that the local commander can take care of? Because this will cause the, general, the Russian general staff to move forces to deal with that. And of course, this creates a real problem for the Kremlin inside of Russia if it begins to look like they cannot even protect their country while they have thousands of troops down inside Ukraine. So if this is by design by Ukraine or if it's just good luck, of course, I don't know that. But it would not surprise me if this was also being orchestrated by the general staff. And then I hear a report that even uh, uh, Ukraine is talking to Moldova about now it's time to get Transnistria, to liberate Transnistria and give that back to Moldova. Again, I don't know any of that, but that's the kind of thing that creates real big headaches for the, for the Kremlin. They have to worry about all these other problems. I think this is all part of the overall design. And then the third condition that has to be met, of course, is the ground dry enough. Will it support uh, hundreds and hundreds of heavy tracked armored vehicles uh, that will be churning up the ground? You don't want vehicles getting stuck. You want them to be able to continue moving. So, of course, Ukrainians will know that better than anybody. Uh, but those are the three big conditions, I think, that have to be met. And I suspect that uh, the general staff is making great progress on achieving at least the two that they can control. Um, the one area where we don't have um, uh, um, enough uh, capability is in, in the Air Force. Uh, of course, finally, finally, the decision has been made to provide F-16s to help provide training, but um, that's going to be a few months, uh, a few months from now. So to recap, Ukrainian forces, I think are very close to being ready. The ground is probably getting close to being dry enough. The Russian uh, forces, I think, are under enormous pressure. I don't know about Belgorod. Is this something that Ukraine is doing or is this something that the, the free Russia legion that they decided to do on their own to take advantage of the opportunity? I don't know. Um, but I, I do know that uh, when, when President Zelensky gives the word to move out, that Ukrainian forces will be as ready as they can possibly be. And I think they're going to be very successful. Thank you so much, General, for this inspiring speech. We do sincerely hope that actually we'll be able to say yes to all three of those conditions very, very soon. And we are going to begin and finish. Good afternoon, Mr. Hodges. My name is Petor Hedko, and I am majority st uh, study student major in, in history and archaeology. And uh, I have a short question for you. What was the biggest case that held US uh, and its allies back uh, from supplying F-16 to Ukraine? Thank you. Yeah. I think th this is something that um, has frustrated me for quite some time, um, that the US government has, uh, my president, who has done such a good job on so many things, he has stopped short of saying, we want Ukraine to win. Uh, and he has stopped short of saying, here's the outcome that we want for this conflict. They say things like, we're with you for as long as it takes. Uh, we are, uh, we want Russia to lose. Uh, Ukraine should get all of its territory back. But he doesn't quite say, and I don't know that in his heart and his and in his mind yet that he is convinced that we should do everything to help Ukraine win because 
he's still worried about the escalation. Uh, and, and I think this is this is the main reason uh, that we've been uh, slow going all the way. That that's I don't know how to say it otherwise. I mean, the president has done such a good job. Um, on top of being the president and doing his normal day job, keeping 50 nations together in support of Ukraine, obviously the amount of equipment and money and support that has been provided to Ukraine by the United States is enormous, but it's not enough. Uh, and I think when the president finally says, our, our outcome, our desired outcome is for Ukraine to win, and that we have a secure, stable Black Sea region where uh, international law is observed and Russian war crimes or criminals are held accountable. When he, when he can say all that, then I think uh, you'll see everything that's needed. No more excuses. It, it'll come there. Um, so that's, that's not a satisfying answer for any of you, I'm sure, but I've tried to understand that myself. And uh, I think that uh, they they believe the administration or at least the ones who make the decisions believe that by this uh, sort of uh, incremental decision-making process has prevented the Kremlin from, from escalating. So they, they think they're doing it the right way. And, and that's why we are where we are now on the positive side on these F-16s, even though they are not available now, uh, they will be, and I think you'll have Ukrainian Air Force flying F-16s and maybe even typhoons in the next three months. Well, that's not too late because you're still going to need top quality air power to, to continue doing what you need until all of Ukraine is liberated. And so uh, from a psychological standpoint, imagine from the Russian perspective, they probably thought they just had to hang on a little bit longer until uh, until the uh, the West ran out of patience or grew tired of this, and now you have air power showing up, that that will have quite a psychological impact on the Kremlin. Thank you so much, General. Yes, we are extremely thankful to the American president and the whole American nation for this enormous support that you're actually giving us all these days. So thank you so much. And uh, time is just flying by. We have had so many interesting questions. We have had so much interesting information. However, we, in the end of your presentation, you said two questions. So we might have an answer to those two questions. And uh, I'll, I'll give a floor to Professor Anatoly Hudoli, please. The General Fodgers, good afternoon. My name is Anatoly Hudoli. I am professor from National University of Warsaw Academy. And uh, first of all, let me thank you for your speech and the question answers uh, session. So what is interesting that while starting your speech, you raised two issues for discussion. The first one, what happens when Russia uses nuclear weapons? From my point of view, I even thought about this issue before this meeting. And personally, I think that it's quite possible, not on strategical level, but on tactical level, if it happens and if tactical nuclear weapons will be used. Probably, partly Ukraine will be destroyed, some regions, two, three, or four. But will it affect the war? It will complicate the situation. But Ukrainians will never surrender. At the very beginning of the war, uh, many intelligence agencies and many countries support that probably Ukraine will stand two, three, or seven days, not more. But still, Ukraine has been fighting, opposing, and fighting back. So statistically, as far as I know, more than 60,000 women are enrolled in the army and they are fighting against Russians. What does it say? It said that Ukrainians will stand to the end. We will never surrender. Okay? And the other side of this thing is Ukraine is not alone. It is, it has reliable partners, reliable and responsible allies. So the situation is not so uh, gloomy as it may seem. So getting to the second issue, what will happen if Russia leaves Ukraine? 
So when Russian troops will be uh, will withdraw or it will be expelled from Ukraine. So I think that the situation will be not less uh, challenging than it is nowadays, because we have to sort out all the problems, resolve all the problems that have been accumulated for many years since proclamation of its independence. So that they will be political problems in political sphere. There will be real actions to the Ukrainian parliament, because we still have deputies of political forces that supported Yanukovych's regime. Uh, there will be economic problems connected with the reconstruction of the country, developing of business, and reforms should be implemented. There will be social problems, numeral social things that also have to be uh, solved. And there, of course, will be cultural problems. So we have to reevaluate what we have, what we possess, and what we should do. But the most important thing from my point of view, what do Ukrainians want on their own? What do they want themselves? From my point of view, I'm sure that Ukrainians want to be members or members of a country of the European Union, live in a fair country without any corruption, to be independent and to have reforms implemented. So we also have close and reliable friends, but first of all, we have to be reliable ourselves and responsible as well. Thank you very much. But let, let me say, uh, Professor, th thank you for that. Um, that's, that's encouraging. And I think what you've laid out, you know, uh, you know what does Ukraine have to do? I, I, after this war is over, I thought that was a very good, uh, compelling list of issues that will have to be addressed because there will be um, political problems and I mean, I was in Kiev in February 2022, February last year, just before uh, the 24th of February, and I can I can remember vividly that there were very very strong political uh, conflicts, and uh, Ukraine was not yet as unified as it is now, and so um, I I think. Uh, you want to build on the positive things that are happening now, not revert back to um, to how it was before. So I, I think you've uh, hit on some very important points. I would ask all of you to think about um, the women and men of your armed forces um, that are fighting now or that have been fighting, what they have seen or what they have experienced. Um, this incredible um, psychological pressure. They've, they've lost friends. They've seen a lot of death and destruction, and, and that takes a toll on everybody, no matter how strong you may be uh, emotionally. And so Ukraine will have to do what the United States had to do. And we, we learned late uh, about uh, what we call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, helping helping soldiers and families deal with what they've been through and, and I think uh, helping the, the veterans who are wounded uh, help them get back into the job uh, market where possible or to to resume their education or whatever it is they're going to do how how a nation treats its veterans uh, and families of veterans is is very important um, your comment about, Ukraine would never surrender, even if Russia used a tactical nuclear weapon. That's that's what I believe also. And I think this is one of the reasons why I, I think that the Russian general staff does not want to use them, because once they do use a tactical nuclear weapon and Ukraine does not stop, then what else do you have? I mean, there is nothing else. And I think the general staff knows uh, that that would be a bad outcome for them. So uh, that's I, I thought that was a good point that you made as well. Let me, uh, here we in the last two minutes, um, I want to say thank you for this uh, uh, amazing opportunity, but I, I have to uh, compliment you. Uh, first of all, the questions, every single question um, was, a, was a very good, uh, complex, question 
that the leaders of all of our countries are wrestling with. So these were not idle questions. Thank you for that. Um, but I am also uh, so impressed with your English language uh, skills. I mean, really impressive. And I say that as, as an American who lives in Germany uh, and I struggle. Uh, my wife tells me I'm the laziest German student that she knows um, because, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> um, it's hard. And so whenever I, I encounter um, Europeans that speak two, three, four different languages with confidence the way that you did, it, it, it impresses me. So I wanted to, to say that. I will shut up and, and give the floor back to you guys, uh, and then we can stop uh, when you're ready. Thank you, General, for these wonderful words. Uh, encouraging our students to actually learn English and understand the international situation better. Now I'm going to pass the floor for a moment to the Director of Institute of National Security and International Relations, Dr. Olga Balatska. Thank you for your lecture. We have been in contact with you to coordinate this meeting. And thank you for your time, uh, for your answers in QA sessions. Uh, thank you uh, for your interest, for your support to Ukraine. Uh, uh, we are uh, very uh, proud of this. And uh, everything has a beginning and uh, the end. So uh, in Ukraine, we say that <laughs> Uh, every uh, uh, also we are looking forward to the next meeting and uh, our university of academy is the tradition that creates the future and uh, uh, we are proud that our institute is uh, the location uh, to create the future because we believe in a victory uh, we believe uh, that human uh, and uh, human rights and values uh, defeat Russian aggression. And uh, uh, we want to say uh, uh, what is a convenient date for you uh, to hold the next session for our students, uh, for our uh, teachers uh, and academic staff. And once again, to thank you. Thank you very much. There is also a few words from the rector of the university, Professor Ihor Pasichnik. Uh, no, first of all, we can make a statement that the United States of America, the commander of the Army of the USA, is the only one who chooses, and the only one who has a high intellect. First conclusion that we can make that in the United States of America, they would not appoint simple people to be the head uh, military man of the military troops, and you are a highly intelligent person. That's what we can conclude. Вы на початку сказали, що коли зачитували вашу біографію, то вам здалося, що ви вже стара людина. From the very beginning, when we were presenting your biography, you said that you felt to be an old man. Мені неодноразово теж так здається. Well, that's what I have felt for many times too. Коли говорять про мене. When they are talking about me. Але ж молодість чудова тим, що вона має своє свій квіт, свої квіти. But youth is wonderful with the thing that it has its own flowers. А зрілість прекрасна тим, що вона має чудові плоди. And all their age is uh, wonderful with the, with the moment that it has its own fruits. Ми мали можливість сьогодні спостерігати ці плоди, насолоджуватись вашою лекцією. We have had this excellent opportunity to actually follow to see these fruits today from your presentation, in your presentation. Я вам дякую за хороші і теплі слова про нашого випускника Валерія Залужного. I'm sincerely thankful to you about good, nice words about the graduate of Ostro Academy General Valery Залужний. Я вам дякую про хороші і теплі слова про нашу славну українську армію. About, for, for your nice words about our uh, Ukrainian army. Ми добре усвідомлюємо, що завдяки їй ми сьогодні навчаємося. We feel confident that due to the Ukrainian army deeds we can study today. Це була чудова лекція, це була прекрасна зустріч. This has been a wonderful presentation, this has been a nice meeting. Я думаю, що вам сподобались наші студенти. 
I, I hope that you liked our students. І ми будемо мати можливість ще раз послухати ще далі ваше виступи у Сорській академії. And we will have this opportunity will be blessed to have more presentations from you at the National University of Kostroy Academy. Я вам дуже дякую. Thank you so much. Щастя, здоров'я, везіння і Божого благословення вам вашій родині. All the best to you, God blessing to you and your family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Дякую. Слава Україні. Героям слава!